Capitalism is an unsustainable economic structure that leads to monopolies that breed oligarchs. And today I want to talk specifically about how it destroys everything it touches and why socialism will always be better. We see its effect today of monopolies breeding oligarchs with fewer and fewer large firms controlling more and more parts of economies and simply buying the government to make laws for them this largely in America, but also abroad and globally. We can look at the Cochabamba water war, for instance, where in the 1980s, the Bolivian government often would turn to funding from the World Bank due to their economy crashing from inflation after breaking off from a dictatorship. And in turn, they would follow provisions from the World Bank to stay, you know, and they're good gracious to continually receive their loans and funding for projects. After lots of pressure from the World Bank around the year 19. 1999 or 2000, Bolivia put up their nationalized state agency water company, Samapa, for privatization. The only party that was willing to bid on this project was, and forgive me if I botched the mispronunciation, Aguas del Tunari, which was a consortium of multiple companies, uh, one being USA construction giant, Bechtel, and also included Spanish, British, and Bolivian companies all in this one consortium branded together as Aguas del Tunari. One of the deals that this consortium received in, or agreed to in receiving this contract is that they would swallow around $30 million of debt that the Samapa had occurred in its recent years. They would also fund expansion of their national water system, thus was supposed to bring water to more citizens. Additionally, they would fund the construction of the Misakuni Dam, which they actually had no real interest of ever doing so. To help fund this and other projects, because, you know, the main proponent of capitalism is to drive profits, and with America being involved, they, of course, have to get their profits. They, and also in blatantly disregarding the intricacies of Bolivian economics in spite of the economics of their more privileged countries, Aguas del Tunari hiked the average water costs up for Bolivian citizens 35%, where the average citizen was paying around $20 a month. This might not seem a lot to Americans or those of us from more privileged, well, well-founded nations, but many of the com- Cochambacha people were only making around $100 a month, and $20 was more than that they were paying for food. And that's one fifth of their monthly income just for water. In complete ignorance of the reality of the situation, a manager of the consortium, Jeffrey Thorpe, simply said if people didn't pay their water bill, their water is just going to get turned off. This led, of course, to months of struggles, protests, riots in the street that even led to a protester being killed uh, before the government was able to reach an agreement reversing the privatization of Samapa. And this is a global issue where capitalism not only creates but maintains poverty. Did you know that five people in the world have as much wealth as the entire bottom half of the world combined? This number has shrunk over the last 40 or so years where it used to be over 10,000 people had the combined wealth of the bottom half of the world. Which begs the question, where does poverty come from and why is it still around? In in Marxism, there's this term called primitive accumulation where people were robbed of their productive means by those with capital. So they're left with no choice but to engage in wage labor to survive. As this process forces the choice of you sell your labor to capitalists in exchange for pay way less than the value that that labor creates, or you starve to death or go without human necessities, which you obviously can't do. It's not much of a choice. Let me read to you a historic truth about how capitalism came into being with much of humanity being tossed into poverty and deprivation. The immediate producer, the laborer, could only dispose of his own person after he had ceased to be attached to the soil and ceased to be the slave, serf, or bondsman of another. To become a free seller of labor power who carries his commodity wherever he finds a market, he must further have escaped from the regime of the guilds, their rules for apprentices and journeymen, and the impedance of their labor regulations. Hence, the historical movement which changes the producers into wage workers appears on the one hand, as their emancipation from serfdom and from the fetters of the guilds. And this side alone exists for our bourgeois historians. But 
On the other hand, these new freedmen became sellers of themselves only after they had been robbed of all their own means of production and of all the guarantees of existence afforded by the old feudal arrangements. In the history of this, their expropriation is written in the annals of mankind in letters of blood and fire. Pretty much capitalism was created from feudalism and that feudalism and imperialism is still around today and this happens in every country that capitalism touches. Let's look to Africa for example, really the the entire global south where, where there's workers who grow crops, uh, food produce as a whole, create clothes, anything you could think of really, but their farms and factories are owned by people in other countries. But if we look to Africa specifically, it can help shed some light on why this issue still exists today. There is a global narrative that Africa is poor and needs our help, when in reality what it needs is the rest of the world to stop robbing it of its wealth. More wealth leaves Africa than enters it every year by over $40 billion. This is why there's a very misleading perception of the foreign aid that we give to Africa. In 2015, for instance, African countries received $162 billion in foreign aid, but $203 billion was taken from the continent directly through multinationals repatriating prof profits and illegally placing money into tax havens and also by indirectly the cost imposed from the rest of the world through climate change adaptation and mitigation. This multinational exploitation that is a direct result of capitalism has led to the $41 billion annual deficit in the 47 African countries where a large majority of its people are trapped into poverty. There was a 1986 study that found that socialist countries actually have a higher physical quality of life in 30 out of 36 countries when economically comparable. Let's look at Cuba, for instance, whose economy has been absolutely strangleholded by America for being a threat to global capitalism. Despite that, Cuba has a higher life expectancy, a lower infant mortality, a significantly lower lower rate of homelessness and higher literacy rate than America. Cuba has done all this with very little natural resources and all the bombs, war, and economic stress placed on them by America and other world powers simply for being a challenge to global capitalism. All 500,000 homeless people in America would be drastically better off in Cuba and the 45,000 people who die each year in this country due to lack of access and health care would be lucky enough to have the chance to live if they lived in Cuba. Now, imagine if America, being a global power already with all of its wealth and, and, and significance, seriously dedicated its resources to converting towards socialism. I believe the transition would first have to be a full social democracy and then market socialism. There would be no outside capitalist force to stand up to America and we have all the resources to make this possible. That's what people who tell you that socialism is some impossible dream don't want you to really consider. Let's take China for instance, a major country, major economy, world power. They are making huge strides towards returning to the socialist nature of Maoism that they were founded on and in the last 20 years the average annual increase of output in China has been around 10%. In the same time America's was only 3%. It's, it's not even close and this is an economy that was built on socialism, majorly leans towards it still, outperformed America's capitalist economy by three times the margin. This is, this is something that America also beyond has the power to do and should have done already the transition should have happened years ago, but it's never too late. I hope this video serves to open some eyes towards the evils of capitalism. And if you enjoyed this video, jump to my channel, check out my video on explaining socialism. I think these two will pair very well together to show you how capitalism will only ever destroy the world and the transition that America should make towards becoming a socialist utopia.
If you enjoyed this video, we are Social Society. We are a commentary channel influenced by society, politics, and the economy. We get a touch bit philosophical and also like to talk about the psychology of things. We're left-leaning here, but also open to our right-wing opinions. The biggest thing about this channel is having conversations that get to the bottom of the truth. If that sounds like something that interests you, consider smashing the subscribe button, leaving us a comment, or even liking this video, because the only way we become a society is together. And until next time, peace.